guys welcome back yeah and we are happy to see you one more time and today we are making really special material yes we have professor Tom Marsh I'm probably saying you pronouncing your first name right Shingo and he is a professor here at the Catholic University of Lublin um, and he works with a lot of migrants and he's very knowledgeable on what is currently going on um, on the border of Poland right now as you may have seen about the migrant crisis between Poland and Belarus and so he's here today to share some more about that with us so thank you for joining us thank you very much and hello <laughs> <laughs> all right okay <laughs> all right so we prefer for you some funny question for entrance that you uh, and we like fill each other more <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can choose one of the answers that I'm giving you mm -hmm. so it fits you more or give your like answer okay. <laughs> as you wish <laughs> okay. so Europe or America America <laughs> <laughs> Holly he never you really likes you more <laughs> okay uh, early bird or night owl? Night owl. Wow. <laughs> so we can meet you here like at 12 uh, uh, like a.m.? Not necessarily here in this building, but yes, I'm, I'm working until the early in the morning, I think. Very early. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Coffee or milk? Coffee. With milk. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. I'll <laughs> yeah. yeah, tell you the story. Okay, my story is different than the previous one. <laughs> Uh, it's about the story of love. Mm, yesterday, uh, I was very happy to, to uh, experience the first meeting of husband and wife, migrant, both migrants in Poland, and the wife was detained for six months, over six months, in this deportation arrest. And the judge yesterday has agreed with our arguments that um, she should be with her husband, and all the courts before have never acknowledged that she's married and she has the place to live in Poland. So they said that she's going to escape to, to somewhere. And yesterday the good judge has looked into the facts, uh, facts and said enough is enough, you know. So six months enough is enough and she, and she has let her go. And I've got a great photo of a husband and wife that got, that met mm -hmm. after six months of not being together. And uh, you know, uh, the fact is that they got married uh, uh, by correspondence before, they, they knew each other before, but they got married by correspondence and they spent together only one day before. Wow, so, one day! And this was the, after this day and this night, she was stopped mm -hmm. uh, by mm -hmm. immigration wow. uh, people, border guards, and mm -hmm. she was taken away from her husband. Mm -hmm. But yesterday, they reunited after six months of being separated, so it's a great story. Wow. That was a beautiful story. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. That's crazy. Yeah, you're like a source of of life story of nowadays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm really wondering how the situation, these people, are influencing on you, mm -hmm. on your life, because you're giving so much time for that. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> nobody normally asks about the, how it affects myself. I would say that everybody's interested in, in this, uh, you know, learning what's going on at the border, but to uh, give you the answer on that, I think it's, it's uh, very much rewarding uh, when you happen to give hope to people and they appreciate it. So this mm -hmm. is first thing. And it's very often frustrating when you see that injustice is being done. So here in Dublin, we're about, I think, 100 kilometers or so from the Belarusian border. Um, I don't remember exactly what that is in miles, but I'll put it at the bottom <laughs> when this is edited. Um, and so being so close to proximity with the border, um, like what are stories that you're hearing on the Polish side and um, how do you think that makes like Lublin specifically as a city, like mm -hmm. um, either instrumental or how that affects Lublin? Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, we Lublin has a history of being the place where refugees were being helped because we, we were uh, the city where two refugee camps used to be located. Mm -hmm. They were closed mm -hmm. afterwards okay. because we didn't have so many refugees in Poland. But now we are very close, approximately 
as you said, 100 kilometers, 150 kilometers from the places where their uh, asylum seekers are trying to cross the border, or sometimes migrants are trying to cross the border. And um, we are also close to detention centers. One of them is about 100 kilometers from here. So. Uh, since it's not easy to get to the border right now, it's not really legal to cro to to come to the borderline. Mm -hmm. So you know, myself and my team, we are uh, concentrating on helping people that are already stopped and in detention to to help them to to start uh, good procedures here and to to uh, present the arguments for asking for refugee status in Poland. So this is our focus. But I also know. Uh, some of us are, are being telephoned, called to, to, to be on the hotline for those that are trying to, to apply for refugee status. To be honest with, with uh, the viewers and with you, mm, I think some group of these people that are crossing a border mm, do not want to file for asylum in Poland. They are not uh, applying for it and that's why I would say the arguments for not letting them go through the border are stronger because Mm -hmm. uh, the principle of non refoulement protects people that are seeking protection mm -hmm. in the country and to seek protection you have to apply for asylum. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, very often it's difficult to prove that somebody has asked for asylum or not, but mm -hmm. I know that many people are not sure if they should ask for asylum here because they have to, they want to go to some families in Western Europe. That's why uh, that tragedy is very often connected with the fact that they were told by smugglers don't ask for asylum here because you will be stuck here. Mm -hmm. So they, mm, they sometimes have very hard choices. The good uh, stories that I sometimes hear is the story about the border guards. Many people are looking at the border guards as, uh, uh, as uh, some part of a problem here and uh, at the border. Hey guys, so we are in the process of editing right now and unfortunately, as you may have noticed, the camera keeps cutting out and we missed parts of the interview. But right here, I just wanted to emphasize, even though this ended up being cut by the camera, um, Dr. Shinov went on and talked about a really beautiful story about the border guards where um, the border guards had asked for, I think it, he said 50 axes and um, the border guards had asked for these because they know that there's a bunch of people um, between the polish belarusian border right now and um, the axes are able to cut down the trees um, that are in the forest it's a very forested area over by the border and that way the people are able to have some wood to create some fires so they can be warm in this cold polish winter um, so I just wanted to make sure that that story that he had said was in there and back to the interview. question is um, more more or less about you, how you're feeling with all these things because for me it's interesting like the person who are from Poland knows this whole background from inside. You're living here, you have probably your family and you know that a lot of people are saying that refugees are not the most like how do they say it? Safe people is a word. We don't know them, we don't know the culture, and it's always like, I don't know, from the one, on the one hand, I'm feeling like, wow, I'm taking responsible for the people because they are, mm -hmm. as you say before, you, they are sick for help. From, from mm -hmm. the another side, they are, they are not the people that we know and we have like everything and proved that for sure mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. will be great for us. <laughs> Uh, I think that I'm not a uh, good representative of Polish society right now because uh, I know and I met refugees in my life and I think 95% of Polish people have never met a refugee. Mm -hmm. So since I've met thousands of refugees in my life and I've seen and I've heard their stories, uh, their true stories or sometimes their fake stories as well, uh, but I, I uh, haven't seen in my life the, the uh, individual that I would be sure that we should be uh, afraid of, of these persons. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I've talked and worked with many of the refugees, probably some of them were, were not honest with us, because sometimes they want to improve the, the situation and make mm -hmm. it uh, better, but uh, most of them I think had very genuine reasons to, to, to ask for protection. So I'm not afraid of these people that are coming. I think that the number of people that were coming is uh, relatively small for our mm, society, for our state. Mm -hmm. We used to have 
13, 15,000 applicants per year and right now we have 5,000 by this time of the year. Oh, so wow. this, is, this is not really a big number mm -hmm. if you look at that. Relatively average uh, yearly inflow of asylum seekers to Poland was, I don't know, 6, 7,000 average. So right now we haven't even reached that. So if we look at that in terms of a crisis, it's not a crisis. Mm -hmm. The second uh, argument is that we, we must accept it that uh, we are a transit country still, so we mm -hmm. uh, would not be the place that many of these people would stay mm -hmm. because we are the first country of EU that they can ask for protection, but they have the you know targets and the families and, and friends, fiancés, wives, you know, husbands somewhere else, and I understand it that they might choose to do it, although this is not feel fully legal. The question that I have for you it's about it. A place for them, like uh, what as um, a society, like from Poland, we could give, mm -hmm. or is it people, or is it refugees, since they stay in our country and mm -hmm. help us improve it, mm -hmm. and feel safety, uh, safety and feel welcome. I think it's hard mm -hmm. with our like what do we feel inside, <laughs> because as a person who live a lot of years in Poland, I'm feeling that they are different culture problem and feelings mm -hmm. that how do you see it uh, you're right to say that first the uh, first the first need is safety yes they they need mm -hmm. uh, asylum they need a safe place so if they are secure this is the first thing but after they get here they already feel okay i'm secure so what next mm -hmm. and then they ask themselves a question will i have a good job here mm -hmm. will my children be able to get education and we like have home, you know, to place to stay. Mm -hmm. I think these are three uh, like secondary needs. First is the safety, and then they don't want to get social assistance. They want to work. They mm -hmm. they want to have prospect of work. And I think the migration is driven by the uh, labor market needs. I think that people choose target countries for migration when there's easy place to find work, mm -hmm. not easy, not good social assistance. This is you know secondary thing, you know maybe it doesn't, doesn't matter so much. So first is possibility of finding a job. Mm -hmm. Second is uh, the education for children. Mm -hmm. And the third, very important though, is the uh, possibilities that you can rent place, rent apartment, rent house, that the state would help you with that. We are not great as uh, a country to offer the third option mm -hmm. because the integration programs in Poland last very short, you know, it's one year. And the uh, financial assistance during this time is very limited. So un unless you have some savings from your home country, which is a true case in many cases, or you can be ready to start your work right away, uh, you think that you will not survive this critical first or second year mm -hmm. of being here. Mm -hmm. But if we were better in providing some, mm, let's say, assistance at the very mm -hmm. beginning, I'm sure because the economic studies show that after 20 years, every refugee in America pays back more in taxes than, than it, it he got during this time of, of, of 20 years. So uh, this I, I've, uh, I've learned about these studies, I've heard about them during some, some lectures and I think that we would also be, because of our demographic situation, we'd be uh, also benefiting from migration, even mm -hmm. migration of, of refugees that are not coming. You know, the rule of the Institute has been here for 20 years and we are uh, uh, tomorrow actually we have the Jubilee anniversary conference on the public interest law mm -hmm. and the um, role of uh, public interest law and uh, pro bono work for the democratic society mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's been a f I think a great uh, adventure I would say I've met fantastic people that, that were, were uh, our graduates, were our students and were other um, lawyers from other places. And uh, I think the, um, the most important part of the Rule of Law Institute is, is people that trust each other and I think that we, we know that uh, we can make a little difference, each of us may make a little difference in the life of other people. And uh, thanks to that it's uh, it's very rewarding. It's uh, something that uh, I think I never planned to, to work in the civil society organization, mm -hmm. but uh, once you, you do it, 
uh, it's very hard to stop. Uh, I think that this is something that, that uh, makes you feel fulfilled. And um, I believe that one of the fields that the Rule of Law Institute didn't plan to, to be active in is the issue of helping migrants and refugees. Uh, it was some sort of coincidence, but I believe from now that we are in the place where God has put us and, and we, are, we are doing something that is fulfilling our mission and it's definitely my mission in, in life for this moment. So I'm, I'm happy with that. So this is something that I, that I do and I think that the Rural Institute is uh, open and would welcome many of the potential interns, volunteers, graduates to, to, to uh, help us to, to uh, provide legal assistance to, to vulnerable people and refugees, migrants. And mm -hmm. this is something that we would, we would like to invite you to. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. And it's really beautiful to see your heart and how much care and that, that your mission to help people. It's like, again, it's so beautiful to see people um, living to their calling and wanting to see the world be a better place and see people um, like not only fighting for justice, but fighting for the good, mm -hmm. fighting for the good that's here in the world. And so thank you for your work. Thank you for taking the time to meet with us. We are, yeah. we are just so appreciative. And thank you very much. Mm -hmm. It was a pleasure. And